Yeah, so um, I am again uh, back, uh, DK Panda uh, from Ohio State. Um, so we'll have the next uh, speaker, um, uh, Jeffrey Goldstein uh, from Northwestern University. Uh, he did his PhD, um, MD at the University of Chicago, residency in pathology at Vanderbilt, and a fellowship in uh, pediatric pathology at Lori Children's Hospital before joining the faculty at the Northwestern. Um, he's in his PhD was studying the muscular dystrophy in fruit flies and mice, but he has moved into informatics and maternal child health, culminating in a focus of placental digital pathology for the last 12 years. He's currently on a K08 for placental digital pathology, is being mentored by uh, Lee Cooper. Uh, so Jeffrey, uh, please feel free to welcome to this um, workshop. Uh, you can share your slides and uh, get started. I'm gonna attempt to share, can everybody see? My talk and hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, you want to have the full presentation? Yes. Okay. Are we advancing successfully? Yes. All right. And you want me to talk fast, talk less, or go over? Um, I mean, we're running a little bit late, so might be, uh, let's see if in 25 minutes we'll be able to finish it, then we'll have some more time for the breakouts so that we don't eat to the breakout session. Very good. So um, in, in that case, I should note that um, the audience may be interested to know that uh, my, my father, my father-in-law, and my K-8 mentor are all graduates of Ohio State. Um, and with that, I'm going to talk about sort of what I'm doing, which is a little bit different, I think, smaller scale and in terms of topic area. So I'm interested in the placenta. Uh, this is the first organ to form. It is the source of fetal oxygen and nutrients. So you can imagine that, you know, during development, the fetus is not taking care of itself. The placenta is doing that for it. Um, it has endocrine, uh, immune and barrier and excretion functions. Uh, and what we find clinically is that most diseases in pregnancy, or most problems in pregnancy uh, can be, ha have a correlate within the placenta. Um, just to give you some examples of things that, that have significant beyond development. Um, one of the things that makes me interested in placenta is the uh, perinatal origins of disease hypothesis or findings. We find that events uh, in utero can have lifelong consequences. So sort of topically being in utero for the 1918 to 19 flu pandemic, uh, those kids, when they grew older, they had higher rates of cardiovascular morbidity, they had lower lifetime incomes than kids that were born a few months earlier or a few months later. Um, decidual arteriopathy, which is a problem with the maternal circulation coming into the placenta, uh, that's associated with uh, the mother's long-term risk of atherosclerosis. Um, and prematurity, so delivery before 37 weeks, about nine months, uh, is associated with chronic lung disease in the kid. And you know, part of my research is to try to really uh, advance this and try to find more of these associations and, and make them more clinically useful. Um, but I'm gonna focus on prematurity and gestational age now. So gestational age, which is the, the time between conception and delivery is the greatest single factor in risk in probability of disability free survival. So there's you know, essentially no survivability for fetuses delivered before about 22 to 23 weeks. Um, and we continue to see high levels of disability up into the mid third trimester. There's a, a plateau of you know, the highest probability of uh, disability-free survival at term, which is between 37 and 40 weeks at the end of the third trimester. Um, and the probability actually goes a little bit down as you go post-term. Um, so, you know, the placenta, like all organs, is time limited, but its time is really at 40 weeks of term. And so after that, it starts to break down like a three-year-old smartphone. Um, Histologically, so on H and E, we see a lot of changes uh, in this period of viability, so between 24 and 41 weeks. So the placenta increases in size more than fourfold. The fetus actually increases in size more than that. So that means the placenta is is becoming more efficient. You need less placenta to take care of a larger amount of fetus. Uh, we see a reproducible pattern of maturation in the villus. This is a high power event for the single placental villus. Essentially, this is structured for bringing fetal capillaries, which are the structures here, into contact with the maternal circulation, which is the area out here. And this allows you to have your exchanges of gas, nutrients, weights, etc. Um, over the course of gestation, the villi get thinner. 
Um, the stroma goes from being sort of loose and having uh, cellularity to being this more pink dense, fewer cells. Uh, the capillaries move from sort of deeper within the villus to being directly under the surface. Um, and the nuclei, instead of being sort of evenly distributed on the outside, form up into these knots. Um, while maturation is a stereotypical process, we see abnormality, so it can be uh, accelerated uh, in cases of, of maternal hypertension or preeclampsia or delayed in gestational diabetes. And so one of our tasks as a pathologist is to say whether we think that maturation is appropriate, uh, accelerated, or delayed. Um, and that requires us to integrate not only all these criteria, which are subjective, but also, as many speakers have pointed out, we have to generate this gestalt over the entire slide or over multiple slides, um, which is um, really beyond the capacity of any single person. Um, and I have evidence of that. So uh, this is a, a group of eight pathologists uh, that, that worked at our institution. So this is one lab, one um, population. Um, and they're asked to tell, uh, you know, here's the slide, here's the gestational age, you think these are appropriate, accelerated, delayed, or something else. And you can see a broad variation in the amount of normal. So one person called almost 75% of their cases normal. One person called 55% of their cases normal. Um, one person called literally two or three cases delayed um, in their thousands of placentas that they've looked at. Uh, this other person calls 15%. So that's more than a two order of magnitude difference um, between these. And so this is the sort of motivation for machine learning, or at least this machine learning project, is to try to help with that inter-observer variability. Um, then it's in bolts here. So this is, uh, I looked at 154 patients, a one slide per patient over uh, 24 to 42 weeks, uh, broken into training, validation, and testing sets. Our whole site imaging is a 20x magnification. Um, we got a little bit of static on this when we went to submit for publication, but honestly, we call magnification at 4x, or you could argue that 20x is overkill. Um, we may say at least 10 large regions of interest. These are usually a couple of millimeters square. Um, Misenko color normalization, um, because some of these slides are older, some of them are newer. Um, and then we broke, our, as um, the AZ folks did, we broke our, our regions of interest into tiles for more comfortable. Um, just for you know, general pathologists, non-digital pathology people, you know, this is what it looks like when we use the annotations. So this is um, you know a scan slide, and you can see these boxes, these are the areas that we're taking. I refer to these as relatively large, um, but there's probably only about one percent of the slide that we're completing. I think the other thing to point out, which is we'll come back later if I have the time, is that you know these are hand selected by me. I'm one of the eight pathologists. So I won't tell you which one. Um, to be representative of the slide and to be good, good quality, right? Not artifacty, not um, you know, not, not some some strange area, and that that introduces some problems for reproducibility. Um, these annotations, uh, then, as I said, we break them up into five to by five twelve pixel fields, and um, I'm going to talk about uh, Puyo Mabarazani and his contribution to the project uh, more on the next slide. But this is sort of his first idea was that rather than calling these individual uh, high power fields, uh, we would sort of randomize them into what's called a glimpse, which is a collection of 16 high power fields from different parts of the slide with the idea that this is, this is more representative than any one image. It's more representative than just taking one region of interest at a time. Um, this you know, is, is a way to sort of build something that looked kind of like the whole slide. Um, you know, if we have multiple regions of interest, uh, we can break those up until we fill up all of the glimpses, all of the glimpses so that we have you know, multiple glimpses representing, each of them is represented on the slide collectively, they represent all the information that we have about the slide. Um, and then, then this, this is the, the pipeline that he built. So this is, this is Priya Mubadrazani, he's a PhD candidate in Lee's lab. He's very interested in this, this idea of attention. So, you know, how do we, decide on a slide which fields to pay attention to, right? In digital pathology, the answer is frequently that a human is going in and drawing regions of interest. Um, you know, in, in the real world, as pathologists, we have to decide which, area, which regions of interest we wanna focus on. Um, and, and, you know, computers are gonna need to do that. Um, so I had built a sort of very basic pipeline that was doing okay. Um, 
you know, Puya's contribution, you know, he came in, he, he came up with a glimpse idea to put everything, you know, together and give us a representative look. Um, and then his, his other sort of major contribution here is the attention subnetwork. So, you know, this network, we have a feature extraction portion, which is based on VGG19, um, which is a series of convolutional networks uh, to produce feature maps. We take an intermediate convolutional output and put that into an attention subnetwork. And essentially what this network is doing is it's extracting features to form single score, which is going to be the attention for an individual high power field, right? So we have 16 high power fields in a glimpse. Not all of them are going to be equally, equally important. Uh, not all of the, them should have their features considered equally. So we use the attentions to weight them. We get a weighted average. And then that goes into a representation learning network, right? This would be a classifier except that we are predicting a number, the gestational age. So this is, this is representational learning. And then we just do a mean squared error between the actual gestational age and the estimated gestational age. Do back propagation for the whole process. Um, so that the, the whole thing is trainable end to end. Um, in terms of you know, accuracy, so we looked at R squared for accuracy. That goes up very quickly in the, um, validation set to somewhere on the 0.85. Looking at our test set, so we have our actual gestational ages running from 24 to 42 weeks, um, and we do pretty darn well. So we have an R squared of 0.94. Uh, the mean average error, so in weeks, so on average, we are within one week. Um, and I would say that, that a clinically significant miss would be greater than three weeks. And out of the 24 slides in the test set, all those are correct within um, three weeks. Um, so I told you, Pui is very interested in attention. And, you know, I said, let's try to visualize what attention looks like by sort of running this over a whole slide. So on the top is, is an H&E of a, a whole slide image of placenta. On the bottom is, is an attention with high attention is red, low attention is blue. Um, and if you look at placenta, you recognize that sort of these areas appear, the sort of more loose, kind of spongy looking areas are villi. Um, and this sort of dense stuff over here is, is, is fiber and this stuff down here is decidua. And, and you know, what I've showed you and what we trained on uh, to, to look at gestational age was all these terminal villi down here. And if we look at the attention, you know, there is some variation between the villi. The biggest thing that the attention is doing for us is that it's paying attention to the villi and it's ignoring the other stuff, even though we didn't train to do that. I said, well, why don't we just look at a whole slide? Why don't we see what happens when we, when we put in whole slides? And this is what happens when we put in whole slides. So on the top left up here is uh, a heat map of a, a single uh, scanned whole slide of placenta with high attention being yellow and low attention being purple. And the, the, the villus core, which is really the most of the placenta uh, is sort of high attention. Uh, we see low attention on the, the basal plate, uh, on these large stem villi or on the, the, the Chorionic plate, which is up here. Um, we have a sort of interesting case where you have this chorionic vessel uh, in this box here, where half of it is low attention and half of it is high attention, because remember, we didn't explicitly train the network to recognize it. This is just, it's doing this on its own. Um, and then if we look at the areas that have uh, pass over a particular attention threshold, in pink you know, are the areas that are it's called correctly, red are the areas where it's missing high, blue are the areas where it's missing low. And, and generally we're doing pretty well, although, you know, because we are inappropriately paying attention to this vessel, we are inappropriately uh, getting some numbers from that. Um, here we had 36 new cases. These are cases that, that the model has not seen before uh, with, uh, without any regions of interest drawn on them. Um, the R squared there is pretty good. The mean average error is 1.4 weeks and 34 out of 36 were correct within three weeks. Again, I think that's, that's pretty good. Um, you know, what's the summary for this? So the summary is, you know, okay, we can predict gestational age from these slides with high accuracy. Um, this is clinically useful when the gestational age is unknown, which is very rare uh, in developed countries. Most patients are getting an ultrasound in the first trimester, which is very accurate. Um, you know, in theory, you know, if somebody is, is, is taking a picture remotely, you know, they could, they could, we could predict the gestational age from them from a single region of interest. Um, we could use this internally for quality improvement or improve inter-observer variability. Um, and I think that the, the sort of this glimpsing use of attention um, has, has, has 
has legs for use in other domains, not just, you know, my particular area of interest. Um, you know, we didn't look at any cases with abnormal maturation. So that's sort of a next step. And then the other things that I want to talk about, if I have time, are uh, generalizability to different sites and quantitative description of changes during gestation, which I think I'll take a few minutes on. Um, you know, I think that, that one of the things that, that our group talked about a lot are problems in dig digital pathology and machine learning. And, you know, I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about how placenta and the findings that from this study can be used to do that. Um, you know, I think generalizability, I think a lot of people have talked about this. Um, I think that it makes sense to think about that in the context of um, machine learning stress tests, right? So my slides are very curated, right? I have one lab, um, you know, they're, they're all done on the same scanner. I've gone through and picked out good quality slides. I've picked out representative regions. You know, in deployment, in the real world, there's different labs, different scanners, even the same scanner with slightly different firmware. Um, you know, uh, if you have slides that are crummy, um, you probably still have to render a diagnosis on them. You know, you can't say, well, better luck next time. Um, and then, you know, I, I think that one of the one of the issues that I've found working with my um, with, with my colleagues is that a lot of the time when we disagree about whether something is delayed or accelerated or appropriate, um, the disagreement is not the interpretation of any individual image. The disagreement is, you know, I throw the slide up and I say, well, this area looks normal. And they say, yeah, but I, you know, I think that these other areas are more important. I think there's more of them. I think they're more representative. And so we're really arguing about attention. Um, and again, I think that that's where attention really comes in handy. All right. Um, you know, we talked about generalizability. I think other people have shown artifacts and vulnerability to artifacts, um, right? I've gone out of my way to exclude those in the future, those are gonna to have to be included. Um, this is from our lab. I wanna just give a shout out to uh, the folks at, at, at Pittsburgh UPMC um, who did a really excellent study on um, digital arteriopathy. And these are, these are images from them. Um, and then finally, you know, I wanna talk about, I'm gonna to try to say something controversial about interpretability, which is that interpretability, how the model knows what it knows, is not a virtue in medicine. That's not me saying whether that's a good idea or bad idea. That's just, that's my observation. And the proof of that is that, you know, if you work in a hospital uh, or next time you go visit the doctor, find a random MD and ask them, how, how is a hematocrit run? Like, what is a hematocrit? This is the single most commonly ordered lab test. And I, I would wager that 1% of practicing physicians know how to do that. Um, you know, I think a lot of that has to do with siloing. Um, a lot of it has to do with, with people sort of, I don't know, technophobia, math phobia, whatever. Um, but we also find that test results are always interpreted before diagnosis, right? So if you have an abnormal hematocrit, a human is always integrating that with clinical information before they're making a diagnosis. So a human in the loop is standard. It's more important for labs to be reproducible or to be sort of, you know, consistent rather than strictly speaking, interpretable. Um, now you might argue we should still be trying to make things interpretable. Um, you know, we talked about attention. Um, I think the sort of husky wolf uh, is the sort of classic attention story. I think that you know what we're what we're working with is is you know also helpful for that. Um, and I think the other thing that 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 I'm interested in from a sort of basic research perspective, but I think also speaks to this interpretability is that we can we know that there are features that vary over the course of gestation, and we can extract those. We can build models that are that are focused on this. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, Lee Cooper, uh, Puyo, Puyo Mabarzani, um, Brian, Pyle, and, and Huma are people that work in my lab. Um, as I was mentioned, I'm funded by the KOA, another grant from the Friends Apprentice, and I'd like to thank my department um, and you for for your attention. And hopefully, there's not a bunch of comments saying we can't hear you. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Can, can you go back to your acknowledgement slide just for a second? Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. So I think please feel free to ask questions. Yeah.
So you Michael, guys, yeah, Michael, you posted something on the on the chat. Is that a question? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I wondered about the best uh, how the best slide was selected, but he did go over that. So I have a more technical question. Um, again, disclaimer: I'm a three-time alum of Northwestern. I'm currently on the EAB of the CTSA program. How can I help you guys get? Uh, a whole slide imaging pipeline for clinical practice up and running at Northwestern? Um, not sure. You know, we have, a, we have a research scanner coming in. The, the, the institution is committed to getting scanners up, but I, I don't know that they know what they want to do with that. Um, so I think that, you know, we, we want to be integrated more in our CTSA, absolutely. And um, we want to have, um, there's a tremendous appetite to do something digital pathology, but I think that, that a lot of the faculty and, and residents are not sure, you know, how to take that first step. And, and I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, well, I mean, let, I, let me I, know I, how, let me know I can help Lee and yeah. yourself and the team you're assembling because, you know, I do think Anil has done a great job at Ohio State. Uh, the Big Ten may become the better home for digital practice and pathology going into total fruition. But I do like uh, what uh, you have in terms of potential partners in the Chicagoland area to make this happen. So use me as a lever to help in any way I can. We will. Yeah, we have a plan. I'll follow up with you offline about that. Are there any other questions? I have a tongue in cheek question. Sure, please go ahead. <laughs> what, what institution has the second best uh, alumni association for bringing funds to the university in the country of American universities? That would be Northwestern. It's number one. You are them. Nope. Ohio State, Ohio State, number one. Nope, Harvard number one by far. Northwestern's yeah. a close second. So we got to leverage this philanthropic network and the growing Kellogg School, which drives a lot of that philanthropy to action for the pathology department. So I've joined the, the Northwestern Alumni Association to rah-rah that and ascend, attended one of their tech uh, seminars, uh, but there's a good network for uh, the pathology team at Northwestern to tap into that I'm gonna help you connect. Thank I you. Appreciate that. Very appreciated.